uh, thanks to Robert Lane for having us. Molly. And we're both so encouraged because everybody's here. This is our first uh, Audio Engineering Society show here. There's going to be more, so I'm really elated, excited for all you guys here. And the next time I think we're going to do this, we'll try to have the other big room done. And so it's just donations, any donations. So yeah, this is Marley Pessig. Hi. Uh, she's in charge of my a major, major part of this whole uh, success of our education uh, you know, academy here. So um, I'm very, very fortunate to have her on board here. But anyhow, thank you guys for coming. And, yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm sure we're going to do some really creative uh, uh, experimentation and some verbiage going to come out of it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, typically, at our, our meetings, um, we'll pass around the mic, just do quick introductions so we all know, you know who's here. Uh, what we're all up to and, and um, you know what's going on. Uh, my name is Chris Beckard. I'm the uh, current uh, chair for the uh, Pacific Northwest section of AES, and uh, I'm a double E uh, by trade. And um, uh, most recently, professionally, I worked at Mackey uh, as an embedded engineer. Uh, actually, that's how I met. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our, our three presenters. Um, uh, the first here is uh, Rick Rodriguez who worked at uh, Alesis in the 90s. Yes. Is that right? And so you worked on the, the MIDI verb and the... Well, no, actually, uh, I'm kind of... Uh, well, I'm a hardware designer. So I worked with the great guys that actually did all the, the magic. But, uh, you know, I did uh, pretty much all mixed signal and, uh, you know, power conversion, analog front end uh, as a hardware guy. But we worked very closely with uh, everybody. It was, a, it was a very tight team. Uh, mainly, I was, yeah, to this day, I'm more of a hardware guy. I do a little bit of firmware, but uh, kind of a hack at it. <laughs> That's a proper way to do firmware. <laughs> yeah. <I think>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but you were there. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. I worked with. What's happening uh, at Alesis? You were there. Right. Uh, I worked there with Keith Barr, who was a brilliant, brilliant designer. And he was the, the real brains behind, um, uh, you know, Alesis. And uh, those of you who aren't familiar with Keith Barr, his first company he started uh, in his very early 20s was MXR. And so he designed the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Distortion Plus and the Phase 90 and all these things that pretty much in his uh, mom's basement. And, um, Thanks, yeah. And he, uh, he laid out his own boards, you know. And some of you might remember the old uh, tape method of laying out boards. He did those, and uh, he painted uh, the, with the Distortion Plus. He painted those hanging him on his mom's clothesline. And uh, he liked the, the color of the paint was from a, a Ford Coupe that he saw that he liked, so that's how he decided he used RF boxes uh, back then to paint them. He says you can really tell the vintage MXR gears because they have like little gnats and stuff uh, stuck on them from uh, there in New York. Uh, so anyways, that was his first company, and then uh, he did really well. He, he, but he sold that company, and, and then he did a little hiatus uh, in the Caribbean. On a catch, I think it was, he had out there. And he would tell me all these stories. But he came back to uh, LA, started a um, company that made uh, Geiger counters, of all things. Didn't, didn't do too well. But then uh, he fell in love with the Lexicon reverbs, and he ended up uh, making a reverb called the XT1000. It was the first digital reverb under $1,000 that sold for 799 retail. And uh, that. The, the rest is history. From, all, from then on, he just came up with all kinds of interesting drum machines, uh, MIDI sequencers, and of course the ADAT. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, and before we go on, if I remember right, Alesis was one of the first ones to do the very large scale integrated circuits, where there's a mass amount of code on a piece of silicon. Is that, am I remembering right? Well, you know, the, the, well, as a matter of fact, the XT1000, the, their first reverb, was all discrete components. It was the uh, 7400HC for those uh, you know that was the high speed uh, CMOS and so uh, you know if you essentially you know inside what's inside of a reverb is a lot of delays the uh, all pass filters uh, and uh, a big ALU and all this was discrete or all discrete uh, you know, little uh, dips you know, remember the dips in there and so uh, his memory his RAM everything in uh, EEPROM 32K in those days I think 16K of a RAM and it was all spread out. 
And uh, now, of course, everything is integrated. But he did go, he did evolve into d designing and building his own ASICs, yeah. So um, I'm going to move along here because I want to <laughs> get to the meat of this. And then uh, next is uh, Sean Costello. Uh, Sean Costello is the principal of uh, Valhalla DSB. And uh, you had a past at um, ADI, is that correct? Yeah, I worked at Analog Devices for um, six years until they laid off the whole audio team. And then uh, before that, I, I'd, I'd done some like computer music work at University of Washington. I'd studied some as an undergraduate, but I was too dumb to like, uh, <laughs> well, it's like the time I either could be a double E or classical musician, and I was not a classical. Yeah, pull your mic right. Oh, yeah. Does that help? Before that, I would, now it's just going to go away. Um, before that, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm bending. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. yeah, I have to just do this. Anyway, <laughs> um, before, I'll just do this while I talk. Uh, I, I, as an undergraduate, I, it, basically there's a great computer music program, but you either had to be a double E or classical music, and I was just too dumb to be a double E. But I was interested in it, and then it's like at some point I realized I want to do that, so I just talked my way into some classes at UW, and then uh, liked it. And uh, so that's just, and then ended up going down the Bay Area, getting a job, kind of learning on the job, working on the job, getting laid off from the job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here we are. Yeah, and then, so, yeah, it's like. Sean came to talk to us uh, earlier this year um, and what, what happened during that was uh, Renee was, was there and Rick, you were there, and you guys were kind of talking back and forth from the presenter to the audience, and that kind of um, sparked the idea in my mind. It's like, these guys just need to sit down and talk, and we all need to listen and, and, and record it. <laughs> guys so, that actually know what they're talking about. And that's so. what this is. Um, Renee, uh, I met at Loud Technologies when I got hired there, and uh, uh, Renee and, and actually uh, Dave Woodbeck here, I, I probably pestered you guys like three or four times a day with questions. <laughs> so I just <laughs> chased you guys down. But uh, it was amazing um, working there and just being able to ask questions. But Renee, you were at uh, Lexicon uh, about the time they were doing the PCM60. Well, you, it, at the time you were, they were doing the PCM60, you worked on the PCM60 and a couple other pieces of equipment that they were doing. I actually started Lexicon in 79. Um, when Lexicon was actually in the process of making a product out of the 224, the first um, studio reverb. And I was working at DBX at the time, and I had been introduced to David Griesinger, who was the, ultimately the architect of all the, the reverb sounds at Lexicon. And Dave had on his, uh, I went to his house, and in his little lab, which was just covered with the stuff. He had out on a desk, he had a, a S100 bus computer. And he said, uh, oh, well, you listen to this. And he gave me some headphones, and he played some sounds. And I said, oh, that's really good. That's reverb. I said, this would be a really good product. I said, I think the professional audio industry is waiting for this. And he said, you think so? And I said, yes. Well, the reason that Dave was interested in reverb is that he was he had recorded a number of very beautiful um, classical albums in a lot of the organs around Boston, and he was actually quite an accomplished recording engineer. In fact, he had done a crossfield biased tape recorder back <laughs> when he was in junior in high school. Right? I mean, he was a pretty smart guy, and I was um, kind of fascinated with this. So I went back to DBX and I talked to Dave Blackmore, the president. And I said, Dave, you know, I think we should take this on as a project. I said, I can see that, the, you know, we're in the analog world, but the world is moving toward digital. And I said, Reverb is a perfect place, you know, t to do this right now. I said, I said, I'm not sure about making audio recordings with digital. I don't know how good it's going to be, but certainly this lends itself well to um, these algorithm, these reverb algorithms. And Dave said, well, you know, I'm not really interested right now. We'll do that. We could do that ourselves sometime. So I went, I said, shook my head. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So shortly I, later, I was introduced to um, Lexicon through a mutual acquaintance. In fact, he was the guy that did our advertising. He did the advertising for both DBX and Lexicon, who were in the same town of Waltham, Massachusetts. 
So Dick says, look, he said, I think I can get you a good job there. He said, uh, all I want out of it is a 3BX. So <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he gave me an introduction to, uh, to Lexicon, and sure enough, I was hired, and I went to work there. And they were well underway with the 224 um, reverb. And I made myself useful by um, laying out the A, to, the A to D and the D to A boards. The 224 was actually composed of four separate PC boards. One of them was the processor controller, and the other one was the arithmetic unit, which was a complete board of Schottky logic. Five volts at 10 amps just for that board. I mean, <laughs> that's what it took to do DSP in those days. But it was optimized just for the reverb, reverb algorithms. And so that's how I got involved in, uh, in digital reverb. And Lexicon became one of the, the founders of, essentially, the, the creators of digital reverb for the studios in the next 10 years. So, and I worked for them for a little over nine years. And when so, you started, 79, when you started? It was 79, yeah, it was uh, like October 79 or something like that. And as I said, oh, yeah, and the, the, the owner, Lexicon's founder was, was Dr. Francis Lee, okay, and he had heard Dave's reverb, and he, of course, took it right over to Lexicon and said, we are going to do this, because Lexicon had already built a digital delay line using a shift register memory. <laughs> <laughs> they did it for um, Steve Temer, who was prime time. No, not yeah. Prime time. Uh, no, Delta it wasn't. Prime. This was pre, way before Delta that. T. This was just a yeah, yeah. Delta T. Yeah, yeah. And used anyway. So Lexicon was already, you know, they were already committed to this path of digital. So my my main um, um, function at uh, Lexicon, since I was not a digital engineer, I was an analog engineer, was to do the analog front ends. And part of that was research into converter, uh, converters. And the 224 used a 12-bit converter, A to D, with a 3-bit floating point mantissa. So basically it would range the, the 12 bits up and down 6 dB at a time to get another 18 dB. So it got 90 dB of total dynamic range with an instantaneous signal noise ratio of 72 dB. But it worked fine for reverb. And I think the bandwidth on that 224 was 8 kilohertz, which worked very well for reverb. Sounded good. So um, that's where all that started. And then my job, of course, was finding um, um, better you know, converter technology so that we could get higher resolution. I did work on the super prime time. Um, or its successor. I guess the prime time itself was already pretty successful when I got there. The super prime time was going to be a digital version of that. But it turned out that the technical challenges were way beyond my capability. I mean, doing a, a, a sweep in digital, <laughs> a frequency sweep, sampling sweep in digital was um, not intuitive. In other words, what, what you would get out of it if you did it. Uh, we played around with it for a number of years. but. Um, I kept trying to focus them on reverb. I said, you've really got something by the tail here. And I said, $8,000 for a digital reverb is great. I said, but only the, the top studios are going to buy this. This is, remember, this is, you know, um, 1970, 1980. I mean, that's a lot of dollars. So I said, we need to bring the price down. So one of the, the next project I worked on reverb-wise was the Model 200. Which insightfully well, they have one here. I noticed. It's an amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was not happy with that product, but I did it. I mean, what? <laughs> why, why weren't you happy? I wasn't happy with it. I didn't like the interface. I mean, it, it it worked okay, but it didn't bring the price down enough. It was still pretty pretty pricey. I think it was still over four thousand dollars. So, sonically, did you like it though? I never played with it that much. I mean, I did the converters, and it was okay, but it was I, that wasn't what I wanted. And so I, uh, I kept pushing and pushing. And we, they had a very conservative management. My boss was just, he you know, didn't want to, might not my boss, but the president, he didn't want to spend money. And Ron was a nice guy. I mean, he took me out in his yacht a couple of times. We had a great times. But he just, he didn't see the, the dynamics of the market, that if you could make a reverb for under $2,000, that was the place to go. You know, just get it down, get it down, get it down. I said, you could just sell these things. You know. So finally, <clears throat> I convinced them that I guess the sales were good enough between the 224. And I guess they came back and they did the 224XL, which is basically a bandwidth improvement. Yes. They came out with the Lark, <clears throat> the Lexicon Alphanumeric Remote Control Head, which really made it just so intuitive for anybody to play, to play around with it. 
And there's an interesting story about the lark also. Um, engineering was involved in it. Of course, it was an, it, the lark was done by engineering, not marketing. Engineering said, this is what we need. This is what it should look like. It should have alphanumeric displays. It should have these controls. It should have these buttons. Engineering, the, the idea was to come up with a name. So engineering came up with um, Lexicon Universal Remote Control Head, or Lurch. And the, idea is when you, and the idea is when you turned it on, it would say, you rang? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, but marketing heads prevailed, and it was called the Lark. <laughs> so that, I thought that, interest, that should be an interesting story to pass on. But it, 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 it sticks in my mind, because we just thought it was just a great name. I mean, what do you say? So anyway, the, so the 224 was done. So the 200 was done. We were looking into, you know, bigger processors and, you know, 68,000 processors and so on. And finally, I convinced them to, I said, if we're going to do a lower cost reverb, we've got, really got to get down. Okay. We need to do some custom parts. Well, what was available in the mid-80s were custom gate arrays. Okay. Um, the tooling for those was pretty stiff. In those, it was like $50,000 a chip. So we... Um, we had a very smart um, engineer, Chinese engineer by the name of Su Lam, and he, crank, he had cranked through the, with Dr. Lee, he had cranked through the uh, timing diagrams for the original 224 using the Schottky logic to make sure it would all work, which is, which is believe me, is no simple task with discrete logic, running at that speed, <clears throat> pushing the envelope. So he sat down and he designed a stuff, and, and it was his job to interface with the companies we chose for the Gatorade to set up the time requirements and so on and so forth. So we finally, we, we had a couple of companies that we looked at. And of course, Lexicon being conservative in, in the cash sense, but not in the smart sense, picked a small startup company in California. And it's like, okay, because they had the best price. So we went with them. And it took quite a bit of time, um, you know, going back and forth between our engineering and, and they, um, to get all the chip parameters. And uh, we designed three chips. We, we broke it down into a, a prop, three different problems. One was a chip to manage the conversion. <clears throat> and at that point, um, Burr Brown had co come out with a 16-bit um, DAC that was affordable. I think like it was under $20, okay, for 16 bits, which had about... Huh? Stereo mono? No, just a single mono. Yeah, just a single. Remember, these were discrete ladder DACs, okay? Um, and it was, um, and so that was, that was available. Um, but since it cost $20, we wanted to make sure we got the most use out of it. So I said, well, we wanted to do both the A to D conversion and then the final two channels of D to A conversion. So my job was to figure out how to timeshare computers. And I'd already been playing with that. I know, I know that there were some interesting problems with time-sharing um, converters, um, which had to do with storage times and op amps and switch, you know, how good a switch you can make, um, how fast you can switch, the sample and hold problems. <clears throat> but I, we managed to implement a good 16-bit um, converter with one chip using, doing both the A to D and two D to A's. We, we made a converter what we call the converter manager chip, or CMU, and that would do all the successive approximation register, you know, stuff, looking at the comparator, checking, and so on. And then switching back and then doing the output for, the, for that. So that was one chip. The second chip was a memory management chip because when you're doing reverb, you've, you're, you're storing and retrieving lots of values back and forth. Okay, so you want something that's keeping track of where everything is with pointers and so on. Make sure that all the that stuff goes in and comes out properly. So we made, a, we made a memory management chip called the MMU, and then we made the arithmetic chip, arithmetic chip which was a shift and add um, uh, device, just like we had done before. <clears throat> so the three chips would do most of the problem. All you need to do is add external memory, you know, some program ROM, um, a, a microcontroller is, you know, load the ROM or whatever. And uh, so that was the basic architecture that we picked on. So we went with this first company, and I think it was like, it was like maybe eight or nine months later, 
the chips came back. And they didn't work. They didn't work fast enough. <laughs> we wanted to do at least 10 kilohertz bandwidth. They wouldn't run that fast. So we, we struggled with it and, you know, we all looked at it and said, look, you know, we just need to find a company that really knows how to do this. And we had gotten a bid from Plessy. Plessy had done a number of these parts. So we spent another $150,000 and we went to Plessy. Actually, it was about 200000 at that point. And Plessy did come back with chips that worked. So that'll, that enabled us to build the PCM60. The PCM60 was done all on one PC board. Um, and I have, I have a board here. It's not completely stuck, but you can get an idea if you want to pass it around. This is the, uh, this was the board. Everything on one board with breakaways for the front panel parts. Um, it had the analog section, the converter section, um, the three custom chips, the memory. We had 16K of dynamic wow. RAM. <laughs> wow, in four chips, they were 16 by so, four. So how much, how much time was that at that sampling rate? Uh, well, it was about 800 milliseconds, I think is what I calculated. It's pretty, sh a little short. I mean, you know, that was the, one of the limitations, is it could have used a little more memory. In fact, the CMU actually could handle two more bits of memory, so we could have, if we could have afforded it, we could have had more memory. Hmm. And these, this was the program ROM here, and then all the discrete logic, and then the power supply sections were up here, and so on. So was there a microcontroller no, switching between the programs? No, microcontroller. Everything was hard switched. Okay, basically when you pushed a button, an interrupt would happen. The, the thing would briefly stop functioning. We were worried about, you know, well, it's going to make noise when it switches. But it actually turned out um, is the switching was always done synchronously on the clock. And it didn't seem to produce any bad sounds when you switch between different programs. So we were, we were lucky. We got away with simple, you know, no microprocessor. I only had one crystal running at 9.16 megahertz. Um, and what was the sampling rate of that? 20 some, a little over 20 something kilohertz, 24 kilohertz, something like that. So about a 10.9 so k bandwidth. 10, 10 kilohertz, yeah, 10 point something kilohertz. It had 10 kilohertz, um, nine pole um, elliptical filters, which are, which are these little s strips here. Um, they were made by the, the Japanese, several, Yamaha made them, I think, and they were like a whole bunch of op amps and so little cans that just plugged in, cheap, not bad. And so the converter was here and I had, I used, um, there was a very nice, um, very fast um, CMOS type, it was a MOS type switch, I can't remember, DMOS, it was very fast, very low capacitance that I used for all the sample and hold and the switching back and forth from A to D to D to A function so I could switch from the comparator to the, the output I to V converter. So that was, it was all done on one board and I think the six, PCM60 sold for about $1,500 at that time. I actually have a PCM60 here. Oh, right. it's, it's, uh, it's right here. It's, I, yeah. I brought out. Oh, it's there. Okay, so that's what it looked like. And this board just sat inside. That's it. And I'm proud to say I laid out this board <laughs> with, with a blue and a red <coughs> pencil on, on two sheets of vellum. <laughs> Took me about six weeks. Um, we put it into the drafting department. They taped it up, and we went to production. It worked the first time. So, so that's what engineers do. So you can pass it around if you like. <laughs> can we talk a little bit, because you're talking about the ALU and the MMU. Two questions. It's like, the ALU, what sort of multiplier width did you use? I, okay, well, it was a 16-bit ALU, believe it or not. Can you describe ALU with the test standard? Arithmetic uh, logic, logic, logic unit. unit. Yeah. <laughs> Or ARU, ALU. Anyway, that was it was 16 bit wide. I think we were capable of six bit or five bit plus sine multiplies, which is similar to what the 224 used, um, and that seemed to be adequate for all of the uh, the reverb that we need that we need to do using doing the all pass networks. Um, so it was as I said, it was simple. If you wanted more precision, you just you just did a double precision function. You just did it twice. You know, but that was. Um, Seemed adequate. I, I just want to point out that, like, uh, the plugins I do, I kind of cheat with a modern computer and don't do high resolution multiplies, and there's still 32 by 32 bit floating point. So <laughs> the fact that it's like that. To so mimic the day. Oh, no, it doesn't, to, to mimic it, I'd actually have to put in clipping. Oh. I, would have, I, would, I, would, I would have 
have to put, I mean, I've done this. I would actually have to sit there and in nodes, reduce the band, like reduce the uh, word size in order to emulate what would have been going on. And that's, but what's amazing is that like, I mean, that's what I talk about. It's like, you know, that, they, that there's certain algorithms that work that way and certain ones that w would not at all. It's like, the, it seems like there's things that uh, Lexicon and Lisis use that worked actually really well with this kind of reduced, um, like the multipliers with very small coefficients, and they did fine with that. Meanwhile, if you had done what's called a feedback delay network, which is more of what you see in the academia around reverb design, most pa published papers talk about that, those would fail horribly with, like, with that. In fact, I mean, there is like, I know that uh, Eventide used a 16 by 16 bit multiplier for a couple of their reverbs, mm -hmm. the SP2016 and H3000. And they had to do so much work of just like, how do we scale things down and manage things in order to keep things from just exploding? And even then at long reverb times, you'd start hearing a lot of clipping. So I, I just, I think it's amazing like what, that like there's these reverb topologies that were designed around what we consider now really limited hardware that still are just like, you know, there's a lark in there, there's larks everywhere. People still want that sound. So I just, I bring that up. And well, is it I, fair to say that how we hit the price point on the PCM60, and for those of us who don't know in the room, there's no variables, they're just presets. It's not like the LARP where we can no. continually vary it. Right. That's how we hit the price yes. point by right. making it presets. Yeah, they're just presets. If yes. you, in fact, if you, you welcome to look at this later on, or I pass it around, it's kind of heavy, but basically there were, you know, you could have a plate or a room sound, you could have um, four different like pre-delays and four different room sizes, and then you could have some high-frequency tailoring and some low-frequency tailoring. That was it. But the number of combinations is quite large. Yes. But is okay, it, is it essentially like like 64 on 128 yes. presets? Yeah. They're, they're controlled like that's cool. Yeah, right. Yeah, ROM was, you know, ROM was easy in those days. You could just have lots of presets. You know, each one was stored in the address in the ROM. Um, there were four, four proms, okay, in that. Um, to, to do the control. So that the, pr the price point was partly hit by that. It was partly by you know the mechanical design, making a very simple clamshell structure. You know, trying to do everything, getting everything done on a single board. Um, you know, with the breakaways, so it's all done in one operation. I mean, everything was geared at keeping the cost down, as as we would, as we could in the '80s. This is what we thought. This is what we thought would be the best way to go, and it turned out. We did hit the 15, well, we didn't have a price point, but it turned out we were able to sell it for $1,500, which turned out to be a good price point. Um, the PCM70 came later, but I was not, um, and Sean has one here, it, that, I was not involved in that. It was a little more elaborate, and it has a microprocessor in it. The reason, the, the, the limitation of the PCM60, if you listen to it for a long time, you'll, you'll hear what the limitations are, is that it's, 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 a more, it's more crude than the 224 even, because it doesn't allow for some interesting tricks that you can do when you have microprocessor control. So what we did actually is um, we leveraged off of these chips now that we had them, okay, and we had them for a good price. Um, we got a better price when we used more of them. We, we built the 480L on this three chip set, okay. But it was my idea, I said, look, let's take the three chips, let's put four of them, four sets of them into a, a rack, okay. And we can do so much more, okay, by passing the data you know, around and using more. And so the, the 480L had the capability of split two separate reverbs or a cascaded reverb. I mean, it had so much more potential because it had so much more processing power. Okay, there were a lot of things we could do in the two, in the 480L that we could hadn't done before, things like chorusing. Okay, and of course at that time memory had gotten cheaper. We did have the capability to address 64K of, of memory, which gave us you know more. And how did you that in the 480L? Two and four. I had two and four, yeah. So you could use it as two separate one in two outs, or as a two in with two separate stereo output. You know, reverbs independent from the same set of inputs and so on. So it had, or you could cascade the whole thing into, into a reverb plus a reverb. So it's you know very flexible. Can you talk a little bit about what like because I know this doesn't have a Z80 as a microcontroller. Can you talk about what the Z80 would have done okay. in the yeah. like the right. PCM7840L? Yeah. What, what made those different? Right. What what Dave learned? Okay, uh, interesting thing. This gets gets back to Dave Griesinger, who was 
quite a clever guy. And if you want to, um, actually, um, there's a very good paper that um, if you go to Dave, David Griesinger's website, okay, and you scroll down his page, there's a paper he gives a link to, which he did in 1979 uh, at the 7th AES conference in Toronto, okay, where he talked about his reverb after 11 years. So in other words, it was 78 when he first did his S100 bus. In 89, he said, here's what I've learned about reverb, about doing reverb this way. And he talks about the various ways you can do reverb and why they're more difficult or very difficult or take so much processing power, but why you can make this type of reverb so successful. And one of the things is understanding how we hear reverb. This is the critical thing. And this, for Dave, was, of course, the whole crux of it. In fact, if you go on and you follow Dave's history through the 90s, he's given some wonderful papers about, you know, envelopment in concert halls, the way we hear the sound, the feeling of concert halls, all of these things, because he studied the way uh, acoustics behaved in concert halls and how we perceive them. And he did it by making measurements of halls, you know, with, with clicks and noises and so on, and you can, you know... In fact, that's one of the, one of the ways we listen to reverb when he was playing with reverb he would have a click generator and a boing generator boing generator was a was a raised cosine pulse you know of sine wave you know different and you could tune the frequency and you could control how long it was and it kind of make a boing and you could listen to how that sounded you know of course if it's too discreet it goes you know like a spring but if you get make smooth reverb you can hear this nice you know envelope you can hear the build up and the decay the critical factors for reverb depend on who's using it for what. That was another thing that they've realized. For the person who's um, adding it to um, a mix or whatever to create the sound of a hall, it's the first couple of hundred milliseconds. It's how does the reverb build during that time, okay? And then the critical part of the decay was only when it gets down about 15 dB. It starts to get masked in all the rest of the stuff, so it's, that's less important, maybe. Not totally unimportant, but less important. So it was that first, that critical time, and then the decay to a certain level. Those were the critical things. But he said, interestingly enough, he said, for the musician on the stage, the critical part of the reverb, okay, is the first 50 milliseconds, because that's when he, hear, he can hear all what the other players are doing. After 50 milliseconds to about 200, we get all confused. So it's that critical first buildup of those first sets of reflections and you have to play with that. And you can only generate those properly with discrete, you know, you've got to create those discrete um, echoes. Because the, the old pass reverberators take too long to build up to the, the final density. But you need to create those first ones, and those are critical. So you spend a lot of the, of the uh, DSP capability just creating those first sets of reflections five, six, seven, maybe 10, okay, that really tell you what the character of that, those first reflections in the hall are. And those have a lot to do about defining the sound of the space and how close they are, how, you know, how intense they are, how, how much they build up. So that's one critical part. In the first half second. First 50 milliseconds. Is, 50 milliseconds. Yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the initial onset. And if you look at, you look at reverb, it's that first thing is there's just, just all, all the early reflections. And then after that, okay, now there's another thing that happens um, in, in, a hall, in a real hall, in any real space, is reverb reverb echoes are not discrete because surfaces have variations. Echoes are always smeared. They have more than just a discrete time. They start to smear, and the more they propagate, the more they smear. So Dave did a very interesting thing in the, when he had a microprocessor available. One of the things you could do is you can make little wiggles in the, in the time, in the tap on the memory. You can go back and forth. And if you, you can make that like a, a pseudo-random sequence. If you do that with several... So you're talking about moving taps. You're moving taps and, you, and so on. So he did that, and he, he, he generated... The way he would do the, the, uh, generate the pseudo-random numbers, he said, oh, I don't have a lot of time to, to generate a pseudo-random number. But he says, if I just add up the, the last program, the last 32 bits of the program um, <laughs> word, you know, that'll give me a pseudo-random number, and I can just apply that. <laughs> <clears throat> so he would do that. And so that when you have the microprocessor, you can keep making adjustments to these things. The other thing that we did in the 480L, which was quite nice, um, to allow it to operate faster and to 
make these changes is that we implemented um, two, uh, two program memories, one memory A and memory B. And so when you make changes, you'd make them in B and you'd flip it over when you were finished, and that would become the program. And then you could change A and flip it over. And so you do this all synchronous with each sample. And so you could make, that's why the Lark works so well. You can move the faders and it just smoothly changes from one to another because you flip, okay. And of course the microprocessor has to interpret it. It can't, like if you push the fader right up, it has to go and do a little, the microprocessor calculates all the steps in between, feeds all those, you know, 32 bit bytes or whatever into the, into the program. Okay, and then it flips it over, okay. so. You have uh, <clears throat> the microprocessor allows a lot more control. That's why we went to the 68,000 in the 4DL. We wanted more control because we had we had eight of these registers to feed. You know, four operating and four <laughs> sitting there getting the new data value. So a lot of it, you know, was just being clever with hardware and also being clever with understanding how the reverb worked. Another thing, of course, is that the old 224 worked well because it had limited bandwidth. It's much harder to do reverb as the bandwidth gets higher. Try for 20 kilohertz, you really have a hard time producing convincing reverb because the demands, the demands on the you know, accuracy of the reverb and the conforming to the shape are, are much more strenuous. Whereas if you keep the bandwidth low, so that's why you put filters into the reverb so that as the reverb builds up, it also kind of decays in the frequency domain. It doesn't. You, you don't, you don't have 20 kilohertz bouncing around the hall for two seconds. It just doesn't happen. You have too much absorption between the air and things around it. But, but so why have it, why have it with the higher sampling? Well, you don't. I mean, in fact, you don't need to. And in fact, we, we never, I don't, I don't even know how fast the 4 I think the 4 does 15 kilohertz maybe. I think it goes all, I think it's a 44.148 kilohertz. Is it, was that more? No, that's right. It was. That's right. Because we had to, yes. we did lock up the standards. The, the, the actual bandwidth. I don't know what the filters were. I'm but, to, was that more of a marketing thing? To get I to think this? it was more marketing, and the fact that we wanted it to be able to interface to yeah. in a digital way to the. Um, oh, okay, that makes sense. We wanted to interface to current digital, you know, consoles or whatever people were doing in the digital domain, so they wouldn't have to go into analog. Renee, no. when did the leases start nipping at your heels on the low dollar? <laughs> <laughs> Early, so right? Anyway, yeah, eighty four. <laughs> eighty four is when Lisa was Lisa was founded, and eighty five is when it came out with the one thousand yep. XT one thousand thousand bucks, <laughs> seven ninety nine actually yeah, right. retail. Fifty percent of your price. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But Keith admits he was uh, inspired by Lexicon and, and really gave him a lot of good ideas. So uh, he was the uh, he was kind of uh, the you know what what electro harmonics was to MXR, he was at least it was to Lexicon. Yeah, he used and. It was actually before we did the 60 because, um, and, and of course, the, the thing I found out later on, he used what, like three bits or something, or two bits plus sign. I mean, it was a very simple algorithm. Yeah, he had And uh, you could get away with it. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a bit, very conservative design in, in those days, of course. And then it evolved uh, more processing power and more integration. But he figured out some tricks, though, that worked with the low processing. Like, if I can get the the Miniverb 2, yep. there's, there's uh, the Miniverb 2 has these algorithms in it that are still used. People like it. It's called Bloom. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is this, it's a reverb that fades in really slowly over about half a second and then decays about 15 seconds. And remind us, a mini of the uh, 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 2, 80 what? 87, I think. 87. Yeah. Yep. And, and part of that is that, like, I, I asked Keith Barr about that. He said, well, like that's something that like the some of the first reverbs he had would just have like they didn't even have a multiplier. It was like you could have a coefficient of one, minus one, point five, or minus point five. Yeah, that was it, yeah. But if you have a whole bunch of what's called all pass delays, which are basically have combined feedback and feed forward so they have a flat frequency response, if you put a whole bunch of all pass delays in series, it builds up the echo density, but it also causes this weird slow attack. And so it seems like basically it's like you could sit there and say, oh, man, how do we get around that? Or like, let's put it in the box. No, use it as a feature. Exactly. <laughs> as a feature that was used by My Bloody Valentine. And these boxes were used all over 90s techno stuff. I mean, it's just the sound that's really unique. Yeah, guitar players really like them. I, uh, they're still used by guitarists. And you can find them Craigslist, eBay, whatever, all the time. But they made a trillion of these things in that. I actually own a couple of myself, but uh, they're, they're nice. I enjoyed them, and then they, I liked them uh, for guitar work. 
I like them more for the uh, than the more advanced uh, midi verb four and, and the quarter verb. So, so, uh, this might be a good time to ask a question that kind of links into what you just said and what Nay's talking about, where it's like the higher bandwidth of, you know, higher sampling rates, it kind of, I, I've noticed that if you run an algorithm at a higher sampling rate, what you hear up there is more what you're doing wrong. Yep. It's like the artifacts show up. So I'm wondering, it's like, is there something about, and I know that Renee is also talking about the 12-bit converters on the early stuff, and then you used um, kind of a floating point technique to get higher resolution. I know that Alesis used a floating point technique on their delay memory in order to like, so instead, it's like that would have been internal to it. Is there something to be said, is like, is it possible that those older processors that, because like basically both of those techniques, if you listen to it, kind of gives you a little bit of noise around the delay. And it makes it's not useful. Hmm? It's not useful, that high, high, high. Well, what I'm wondering is if the noise that you're hearing in there kind of helps mask some of the, like if you'd implemented that in a higher resolution, like floating point algorithm, is it gonna sound a little too precise? Like yeah. basically things like there's some blurring that happens, kind of like a blurry photo you know, or, you know, it's like, or drunkenness can kind of like make things look different. <laughs> or dithering or yeah. anything like that. Well, uh, yeah, there's actually uh, the benefits of the floating point is theoretically, a lot of the stuff, theoretically, you get better signal to noise ratio uh, dealing with them. Where if you have a lot of uh, multiply accumulates with uh, in fixed point, you could kind of potentially saturate. But, and, yeah, it's because I know that, like, uh, yeah, like the Elisa stuff is it decays away is pretty quiet. I know that some of the, like, the lexicons, like, you've got 16-bit accumulations. You really have to be careful in there to avoid getting, like, yeah. you know, you can't do some of the tricks that were done. Like, you can't have really high all-pass coefficients without clipping. And, mm -hmm. But is there something to be said about, like, is there, could, it be, is it, could that have been helping the sound? Or is it just, like, or was it just something that you had to deal with, whether it helped or not? It's like, this is just the reality of the situation. Well, like I think what you were saying, it kind of gave a defined sound people got used to. And uh, I think it was uh, overused uh, pretty much in the 80s. <laughs> you know, it, it, you overused things? Uh, yeah. Uh, especially, like, reverb and, and things, the Vangelis and, you know, these, these other uh, <laughs> kind of very popular music at the time, pop music was... You could really, I mean, some of it was just drowning in, it, in reverb and chorus and effects. But that kind of defines the sound. I mean, you sit there and you listen to it, you can say, yeah, or soundtracks from movies. You say, oh, yeah, that was definitely the 80s. Anything that sounds as like, sounds like uh, ch chariots of fire, you know, you know it's <laughs> an 80s thing. So uh, it's interesting how that, uh, that kind of uh, became a characteristic that people got accustomed to. I think so. I think that the noise wasn't, was never considered a factor. I mean, look at, Back, you know, go back a little earlier in that decade, you know, I did the PCM41 delay line, which used a 12 bit converter, but I wanted to get a little more range, 15 bit. So I used a, a log, you know, a compander and decompander using diode compression. So basically, I said, well, you know, you got these top three bits. You know, really, in digital, I mean, the top three bits are just used for the peaks. So why don't you just compress all that stuff, you know? And then undo it after, and that worked really well for the delay line because you could you end up with storing 12 bits, it's cheap, um, and it actually sounded pretty good. Um, we didn't do it in the reverb because we were concerned about what would happen when the stuff came back because obviously it had no relationship to the original, so <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> Can't undo the log, but but log companding. I was always fascinated with log companding because the telephone company used what seven bit log companders, you know, and got eighty dB out of it. I was, you know, why not? If you use the actual perception at those top, you know, you don't hear that noise when it's up in the at the peaks you know you don't hear the noise down there well, you, yeah when you talk in the digital world I, I most people are familiar with the term signal to noise ratio but there is a uh, theoretical maximum uh theoretical formula and it's uh, 6.02 times n the number of bits mm -hmm. plus 1.76 yeah. gives you the DB, yeah. theoretical DB, that's absolutely theoretical it has nothing to do with reality uh, you know, Perfect and the and the adder, the, yeah, the one point seven six um, a dB is added on as an adder for a for a full scale, uh, you know, one volt RMS uh, sine wave. So you you throw that adder, but you're never going to listen to you know, no. a full scale one volt arm. Most of the stuff's going to be minus twenty or whatever below your maximum because okay. you have to have you know, transients and so on and so forth. So you can fool yourself, and uh, that's why things like uh, companders and things would work well. 
in that type of environment. Hey, listen, well, we live very happily with you know um, tape recordings and and LPs with seventy to eighty dB. I still signal to noise ratio. <laughs> yeah. they're they're flying in most circumstances. I mean, yeah, if you really put your ear there, you can hear the noise. But you know, if you don't believe Renee, just go talk to the audio files. <laughs> <laughs> They'll talk your ear off about it. Uh. Yeah. And more bits is nice if you're processing in the digital domain and you do a lot of processing because you're going to be throwing stuff away eventually because you've got to do round-offs and dithering and so on. But for the actual final result, I doubt many you know, home systems achieve better than 80 dB. I mean, you think about the noise of your room and the maximum level you can produce. And, you know, you don't... I'm not going to say you shouldn't have it, but I'm just saying... It's in it's re nice in reality, we we're yeah. very happy with... the. Uh, the amount of dynamic range. In fact, I was kind of impressed is that we're getting off topic here, but um, there's a very nice paper by um, Gravero and those guys at CBS about the dynamic range of LPs. And in mid-band, they have 88 dB if you per process perfectly. If you, if you cut a clean lacquer and produce a stamper with no excess noise, you've got, because of the RA curve and the, and the place where, you know, where you're most sensitive, the mid-band, you've got 88 dB of dynamic range, which is pretty impressive. And that's why they give you A weighting. It's, well, uh, you buy a couple yes, you're going to weight it because you, if you look at the fletcher munson curve, when you get down at low levels, you know, you're only hearing, you're hearing this stuff here, and the rest of the stuff has got to be up there before you can hear sensitive. it. Sensitive. So yeah. that's, <clears throat> that's what it's based on. In fact, very few tape machines actually could do that. One thing that I've, like, I'm just going to speak from a postmodern perspective here, because that's a pretentious word I like to use. <laughs> is, um, but one of the things that I did recently with one of my plugins is I started actually emulating, like I have an emulation in there of the 12-bit floating point converter. I just put that on the inputs and the outputs, and then I emulate some of the processing and what's weird is that people generally it's like you put it on and it actually does give you a wider stereo image and it's one of those things like why on earth would it do that and i've never seen anything published about this and i don't want to go off into some you know it's like it has to have a reason it's not like you know fairies and elves are in those bits it's like this is so but what i'm wondering is that if it might just be that what it basically does is it introduces some time varying randomness between left and right channels where there's like basically, I mean, one thing that I think Griesinger actually show, talked about this, that if you put kind of low level mid range emphasis noise, different noise for left and right channels and mix it in kind of low in the signal, it makes it a bigger stereo image because you have different things going on for the left and right ears, even though what you're mixing in has nothing to do with the original content. It's just, yeah, but, but it's different for left and right. And so if you look at these things, it's like the noise that would be introduced by 16-bit quantization or floating point like ADs, AD and DA converters or floating point delay memory might be doing some sort of strange, like something, just something different between left and right channels. I'm, I'm not really sure why, because I've never, you know, someone scientific or logical would have to actually do a paper on it. I'm just kind of... <laughs> I, my, my stuff's like, I don't know. Do, do, will people buy it? Do people like it? Good. It's like, I, I would love to know why, but it's kind of like, right now, it's just like, just put it, I mean, I, and not putting in, just, I mean, because some stuff you put in, it's like, oh, that sounds like hell. That's what the real thing was, but you don't have to do that. But it's just interesting to see some of these kind of like, lim, if you kind of, these limitations might have actually contributed something to, but, but that worked in, co in conjunction with these kind of like the models that were that they had the horsepower to do at the time. Well, there is a uh, neglected uh, feature that a lot of the hardware guys, and I know there's a lot of you guys here that uh, really believe in your audio precision, believe in your scopes, believe in all these things. But there is an awful lot of processing going on between your ears that uh, is often ignored. There's a whole science of psychoacoustics behind it. Yeah. And there's very fascinating effects. Uh, like there's the Haas effect. Using with stereo with a stereo headphones, if you have a perfect uh, tone coming into both ears, and you just delay one by like, twenty milliseconds or so, it completely drops in amplitude. And even though it, it's technically the same, and I, and I know JJ uh, Johnson is the, another expert. Uh, he's not here tonight, but uh, he was uh, paramount in the development of uh, MP3s and various comp uh, compression techniques. And they take advantage of things like masking sensitivity in the Fletcher Munson and uh, 
these various psychoacoustic effects to where they, uh, you know, anybody, I think, under 30 thinks an MP3 is, uh, is the way to go. And, um, and it's because they, they've really done a lot of work in, in the processing, you know, mimicking the processing goes inside your head. So certainly, I, you know, I couldn't answer your question, but I, 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 <laughs> it's not uh, fairies or, or, or magicians. In there. <laughs> it's uh, it's some, probably some kind of psychoacoustical effect. That I'm sure someone knows. Now, when you add those 12 dB blocks to the in and out, and you let people listen to it, it's more pleasing to them. It's yeah, it's one of those things that uh, I I think it's like you know because you definitely hear it. It's like it, it adds noise and it, but it adds like there's you know there could be I mean, it might be you know there's distortion at certain nodes and stuff. So it's adding this thickness and also might be because there's like you're reducing the dynamic range from floating point to whatever you know, emulating some sort of, like, transients might be getting clipped because of that. Like, transients that, like, in a pure floating point might, these transients might come out just nice and peaky and loud. And it's like, whereas, like, if they don't, they come out kind of less, less peaky, or maybe they're not going in as peaky. And if they're not going in as peaky, it's not, it's not ringing those all-pass filters as much. It's like, it's something, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, some of it might be, like, reducing kind of, like, peaks inside the system, some of it might be reducing peaks that get into it, because those peaks don't, you know, don't necessarily flatter the algorithm that you have going on. As a matter of fact, like, you know, I know like the 224 and 224 XL, they had um, audio, like, transformers on the inputs and outputs. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. That was, um, <laughs> that was fairly common in those days, <laughs> to have transformer I.O. <clears throat> but... Because one of the reasons was it was difficult to do a good balanced output without transformers. Let me tell you, I went through that. I've tried every balanced output configuration that anyone has ever thought about. <clears throat> they all suck. Trans <laughs> transformers work really well for creating balanced outputs. But that aside, I'm just thinking about this um, 12 bits or whatever, 15 bits or whatever. One of the interesting things to think about is that with all this processing that was going on, I mean, we did a whole slew of these all-pass things in Cascade with 16-bit, you know, wide word. We never dithered anything. And so I'm wondering if that aliasing that's created actually adds some complexity or density to the reverb. You think about it. <clears throat> I mean, it happened many times, many times. That we never, you know, we never thought about dither in those days. Dither didn't come along until <clears throat> people started you know, <clears throat> looking at the sigma delta converters and saying, oh, you know, and processing and so on. And, you you turn up then, that reverb. I mean, like you turn up on a 224 XL or mm -hmm. on a you know, the decay time or on another place I've heard it, which has a similar kind of floating point thing is the AMS RMX 16, and there is noise in there. Oh, and yeah, it's like, and there I think, is. but but there's not, but it's not necessarily noise. It's like it might be amplifying noise from the inputs, but I think it is more just like weird quantization noises and like in all these different nodes because you're trying the, the network like basically a reverb network is you're trying to make it sound as random as you can while still sounding good not bad random but like kind of just make it so that nothing rings out more than other things everything all the frequencies decay away at the same rate but they're not spaced next to each other you really mm -hmm. want like you basically want and that's the sort of thing that so, like, it might make sense that if, like, the noise floor or something like that would sound a lot like randomness. Mm -hmm. Well, it is and, hard. We, and no one ever complained about random noise. It's only when the noise gets tonal that it's a problem. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> Which was the big problem with sigma delta converters in the early days because they had these little pitched noises. You know, the, the noise spectrum was like wow. that because of the, the high order filtering. That's why they went to more bits and people learn more about how to do um, noise shaping filtering but yeah the sigma so. delta pretty much uh, well it depends uh, TI calls them sigma deltas and delta sigma delta analog sigma, uh, yeah. analog devices but it's the same same thing <laughs> uh, they were very expensive originally and you know, you'd uh, the, the, the uh, least uh, less expensive devices like the R2Rs and the SARS and things you can still get those today and they're still less expensive but originally the uh, sigma deltas uh, the first ones I used uh, were uh, Crystal, which is now which mm -hmm. is bought by Cirrus. Cirrus, yep. And they were, uh, gosh, like thirty bucks a piece mm -hmm. uh, for right. these uh, for these DACs. And that's what inspired uh, Keith Barr when he said, "Oh gosh, I can make this silicon," you know. And uh, uh, for those that you don't know, uh, Elisa Studio Electronics was the name of the company, and then he did a split where he did uh, Elisa Semiconductor. 
And did uh, that become Wavefront? That became Wavefront and 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 the Spin, <laughs> the name. But um, interestingly enough, what we had at least this was an electron microscope. That's just what a weird, wacky place it was. And uh, wow. you, you would, <laughs> wow. uh, you know, what you could do is you could take a chip, like a like a crystal DAC, and you could, you know, with some very very, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, smooth techniques, you can eventually sand down the plastic dip. Uh, package and put on an electron microscope and see the different layers of the substrate that was in there and how it, uh, a little bit of reverse engineering and you know it's uh, I mean for the purists might say well that's uh, you know plagiarism or whatever but I mean honestly as a I don't think there's a hardware designer among us that hasn't done a cut and paste here and there. I think so that's called engineering, Rick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's called engineering yeah. design. The rest, you know, first thing I mean, you do is look at all the competition and see yeah. how they did it. But that's still, that's only 20% of it. If you really want to maximize performance, oh. you've got to know what you're doing as far as a lot of other nuances. But, sure. But, uh, you know, cutting and pasting, uh, it, was, uh, it was reverse engineering, I guess, is the official yeah, term. that's what it's called. Yeah. But yeah, so we had this electron microscope. I never really played with it. I was afraid I was going to break it, but uh, <laughs> I used to like to watch, uh, you know, how it would, it worked. Wow. Uh, you could... Um, do all types of things uh, to get all kinds of good ideas at the silicon level. And guys, the Sigma Delta, for some of us who don't know, am I right? Is that the one bit? Is that the newer one bit? Yes, it's yeah. got a Sigma Delta modulator is actually a uh, first order, this was the first ones were first order, uh, basically an integrator, a comparator, uh, a flip-flop, and, and then it would all feed back and then you basically, what you would do is oversampling. Oversampling means essentially is uh, 44, fast. yeah, 44.1 or 48 kilohertz is is your sampling rate. Uh, you would go, you know, 64 times, 128 times, 258, six times higher than that. And what you would do, uh, it's, the math gets a little arduous, but the concept is good. What you would do uh, is push all the uh, what they call the Nyquist frequencies way out there uh, on the in the in the spectrum. So that then you instead of using these high order elliptical filters, and I, and I we used those originally not ellipticals, but we used uh, high order filters. They used to be called brick wall filters, and like right at you know right at 22 kilohertz, you just had to drop way down, and any stuff that got in beyond uh, the sampling frequency divided by two or the Nyquist frequency could potentially get uh, modulated back in and, and and sound terrible. So the sigma deltas uh, with the oversampling push that way out, and then. Uh, Interpolating uh, the data, or the use that uh, essentially, essentially uh, if you're sampling that fast, you have a lot of samples that you don't need. So then you'd have a decimation filter after that, which is essentially would just throw out a bunch of bits. And, and surprisingly, what that did did was you gave you a, a first order low pass with the integrator, and then you would get a, um, a high pass filter for all the decimation noise. So it's just an, an amazing. I still marvel at. The well, but the thing is, it's simple. That was um, there was the company back there, Delta Lab, that was doing um, delay lines based on um, Delta Mod. Mm -hmm. Where was to give them trouble, you know? But basically, they sampled at 12 megahertz or something like that. <clears throat> basically, it's a one-bit converter, and you're basically you're only sampling the difference between each analog value from sample to sample, but you're doing it at a 12 megahertz rate. You get only small changes, except at high frequencies, they get bigger. When you think about it, the Nyquist frequency is 6 megahertz. You only have 6 dB or so, or 7 dB of signal noise ratio, but when you take that 6 megahertz Nyquist and you only look at 20, to 20 kilohertz, well, you really got a lot of signal noise ratio because that noise is spread out over the whole yeah. Nyquist frequency. So yeah. that was the basic idea of simple delta mod. But was the delay line in those actually running at 6 yeah, megahertz? Yeah, they running how much, memory, how much memory? Oh, but it's one bit of memory. One bit, only one bit. So ah, the trick okay. was to, yeah, it's, it's you know, you, it's almost, you think, I mean, they're doing that today. What, that's what Sony does with, did with SACD or DSD. It's basically yes. one bit screaming along at 12 or 24 megahertz, you know, and, and encoding. Whatever. Of course, they're keeping all the bits, which is a problem, but it takes, a lot, <laughs> it takes up a lot of space. But to get the tremendous signal and noise ratio in the, in the audio band, you have to do some noise shaping, and that, that's where the high order filters come in. You kind of push the noise out of band, and then you throw it away. I so think now it's uh, third order is pretty standard in the destination filter as, as well. The problem is, uh, you know, in the analog domain, which I spend most of my life, always have, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but there's, it's, uh, there's a lot of, of course, similarities 
in between the two and, and the parallels between digital and the, the digital and the analog domain, of course, uh, there's equivalence, equivalence between the two, and it's all shown mathematically. But uh, it really uh, is, is interesting how um, these filters that you would use, uh, once you go beyond, say, third order using a single, single feedback unit, you get real sensitivity. So it becomes kind of an issue to where you could get to overshoot or you start messing with your, uh, if you look at the S-plane, whatever, that you deal with this type of thing. But you start messing with, uh, you know, a potential, uh, you're limiting your phase margin and your gain margin and potential oscillation. Mm -hmm. So third order is pretty, uh, pretty impressive that they can do that. And these sigma deltas, I don't think they'll go beyond that. No, one of the reasons, one of the things they did, of course, is they just, decided to start, if we start with more bits, we don't need as much filtering afterwards. Right. So most of the mm -hmm. converters today use four or five bits for the, you know, conversion, which gives you a lot, a lot more to start with and you don't have to do such extreme filtering afterwards. But yeah, if you look at uh, your data sheets, you get to go online and look at some of the TI and all these other companies that come out with these amazing devices, analog devices. You look at the data sheets, and they'll have that theoretical, or you know, you'll know the theoretical, and then they'll have what they are for as far as their signal to noise, and then that can all be completely destroyed if you don't lay it out properly. So that's really where the the analog comes in, where you a true analog designer, he's going to look at it from a systems level, from a board layout, from a component placement, yep. and you you know you have to know your your reference points, your grounds, and everything, and your signal return. But basically, what it is is that uh, the mistake that people make is that what's on your schematic can be laid out uh, you know, with some auto-routing, worst case, and, and then somehow it'll work. You're going to destroy 20, 30 dB. I, I mean, I've, heard, I, I've seen like uh, people come back with designs, I don't want to say where, but you know, from that way over the Pacific, come back <laughs> with, with uh, you know, signal-to-noise uh, measurements of, a, of 40 dB. And I'm like... That's noise. That's all kinds of stuff. That's uh, you know, CBs, ham radios, low-flying aircraft. That's every day in the kitchen sink, uh, buzz, hum, just, you know, uh, power supply, garbage. Uh, and and it, it just has to do with, uh, you know, uh, the mistakes that you can make in the, uh, the physical world. So you have these awesome specs with your data sheet, and it, there's a, a dozen ways to screw it up. So when you were doing this for both of you, like doing the, the analog designs for these reverbs, were you doing, like, was the goal to, like, were you just going for, like, as clean as possible, or were you doing, like, noise reduction, like, pre-emphasis, de-emphasis? Two separate things. Well, uh, but uh, essentially from the, you know, from the hardware perspective, yeah, you're going for absolute performance and reliability and uh, all types of things. Uh, the, the broader term would be, you know, for any mix signal, you have to, you're dealing with digital and analog. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, your first, you know, you got to have a, you know, there's a, there's a million rules of thumb for this type of stuff. And, but all of those rules of thumb, thumb uh, type of uh, anecdotes are based in real science, real engineering. Dig deep enough, you can find them. And, uh, you know, you don't have to know Maxwell's equations or apply these types of things. But uh, it's good to know uh, the, uh, the fundamental elements and uh, the parasitic elements that, that, that exist inside of a PC board or any kind of a layout because uh, they can uh, cause real havoc if you're unaware of them. But you'll, you'll hear these rules of thumb for any per person in layout, though. You know, the, the main thing is they'll tell you, you, know, you be wary of where your currents go. You know, always know that for every signal path, there's a return path. And, and for every power supply, you know, uh, power distribution, uh, Trace, there's a return trace. And you just you have to know all these various things. And some people will talk about split grounds on the board or how that's good, how that's bad. Best bet is to start with the, the device you're using to start with their data sheet, their application notes, companies like Linear Technologies, Analog Devices, TI, which is now Burr Brown and National and everything. Serious. You call them up and you talk to them, and they're more than happy to help you. <laughs> Uh, and give you, you know, because they make eval boards usually and all this stuff. They also like audio guys. They like audio guys. It's more entertaining than most of what they get to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's true. I mean, like, I worked in analog devices. It was just like, oh, my gosh, we got an audio guy. It's like, yeah, we got to talk. You got to do car audio. It's like versus, like, the professional audio. It's like, we really want to work with them. It's like, well, 
Everybody, everybody <laughs> likes audio money guys. in Pro yeah, Audio. Yeah, exactly. Right. More, more money in Car Audio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know. Yeah, That's what uh, my friend over here told me. I said, I'm going to be an audio engineer. He said, yeah, you'll get checked. That <laughs> 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 uh, didn't pan out that way, but... <laughs> Have we covered all of your, um, <laughs> you all your key cover? questions? Oh, Sean, I don't know. Sean came up with a few key. Um, I mean, you, you, guys, you, guys, you guys have been really interesting. I'm just, yeah, I don't know if we're happily listening. Hey, guys, I think now is a good time to break. Good, good, good. Yeah. And then uh, when we come back from the break, then we'll, we'll see go through th- Sean's questions. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what do you guys think, 15 minutes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So we'll do a 15-minute break. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.